about 30, 30 degrees, something like that. I once actually calculated this. Um, oh, 50 degrees. 50 degrees. Let's see. Yeah, that's pretty effective. See, the light is unpolarized coming in here, strikes the mirror, it comes through pretty well there, pretty well stopped here. Let's see, I'm going to do it even more. Yeah, that's about the same. Let's see. 50 degrees, 50 degrees, 50 degrees. Better than 145, right? Let's see here. Um, even more, maybe. Let's try that. Yeah, it's got to be more than, uh, the reflected beam has got to be more than 100 degrees. So it's got to be more than 90. So let me try it further. Let's try that. Okay, let's see what we got here. That chopped it off pretty badly. That chopped it off pretty badly, too. Oh, I can see this. I can't, can't quite see that. In any case, the point would be that at a certain angle, the reflected light has one polarization. The polarization coming out of the blackboard comes out. The one going this way is stopped. And that has to do with the, the way the reflected beam is generated by the mirror. The atoms in the mirror are being shaken by the electromagnetic radiation coming in, and they don't radiate this polar the, the polarization this way. It's stopped. This one does not exist. The one that comes out is the one in this direction. Because what's happening is the light that comes in is vibrating the atoms this way, and as, I, as we talk about, acceleration in this direction produces radiation in that direction. So that wave lives. But vibration in this direction, let's see, the light is refracted. The, what, what actually is happening is that there's sort of like 90 degrees. I, I, this about, can you see this beam here? There's a beam here, and there's a beam here. When those are at 90 degrees, what you have is that the light is driving the atoms in the plastic here. The, the, the vibrations this way produce no radiation in this direction. The light, you know, the light in, see the light that's, the atoms that are vibrating this way on this refracted beam, they don't produce any radiation along themselves. So that, that, there is no vibration in the refracted, in this reflected beam. See, the reflected beam is going that way. On the other hand, this refracted beam is also vibrating in this direction and it radiates in that direction. So that wave comes out. This is the physical explanation of Brewster's angle. The fact that the refracted beam is the one that's generating this wave. If this were here, you wouldn't have a reflected beam. So the, this material is generating this refract, the reflected beam. But it's re producing that by being shaken itself by the incoming wave. And the way it's vibrating, it can't generate a polarization this way. There is no such thing. But it does gen generate a wave of polarization this way. So the, the light that comes out is polarized. In what we say, if this is the plane of incidence, it's perpendicular to that plane of incidence. You'll have to think about that. But that's the uh, explanation. Um, yes, there's a question, sir? Yes. Oh, it's refracting at this first surface? Yes. Yeah. Coming at the, at the same angle this way? No, it won't do that because this is, this is a different shape. What you're, you're saying is something I should perhaps have mentioned. If, if the two surfaces were parallel to each other, it would come out just deviated. In a, in a plate glass, that's what happens. But this is not. This is a, you see the circle surface? So when this light comes out, if the, if, the, if the beam of light passes through the center of the circle, see, let's say I hit it here, and I pass the light through the center of the circle, it's going to be going out on a radius, so it's coming out normal to the curved surface, and so there is no refraction at this surface, so it comes out straight. If, the, if it were like this, then it would bend this way, and when it reaches the surface, it would bend away because it's hitting the surface the normal at an angle. And I chose this deliberately to get rid of this other second refraction. So I, made, I thought I made it simpler. I made it for you. <laughs> but that's the idea of the, of the circular thing. If the light is coming from the center of the circle, it always hits the surface of the circle perpendicularly. So it's going right along the normal. There's no refraction. If you go along the normal, there's no refraction. Good point. It, um, so it depends on the shape here. Hopefully, yeah. How we, you know, we're going to get evicted at 4 o'clock, so I have to move along. Um, so that was a point well taken, that uh, it depends on the surface. Um, then we have chapter 31 which is your, probably your lab this week, which involves mirrors and lenses. It's not as hard as you might think, because basically there's just one formula that applies to both mirrors and lenses. Uh, and it's this, um, is there any questions about this? Okay. Uh, well, we, we use the, the property of refraction and reflection ah, in, um, in understanding mirrors uh, uh, that, that are used in applications. For example, spherical mirrors, which are means that you coat the surface of a sphere with reflecting material, such that the light will reflect off this uh, very well, the way I chose this nice uh, coated material, I get a nice reflection. So that's what I'm going to do here. Uh, let me, uh, for example, this is, this is part of a sphere, and the inside is coated. So I have what's called a concave surface, this surface. On the other hand, this one is the convex surface. I have to remember, this is more like a cave, this way, right? Okay, so if um, it works the same way, I think I'm through with this. Ugh. And uh, let's see. You'll be playing with these things too soon. Okay, so now depending on how the, um, the the ray comes in, I get a reflected beam. If I make it come in right along the axis of the spherical surface, you get that. But if I tilt it, so you get something like this. Now the interesting part here is that what happens if you have multiple beams? Let me turn on some beams. Okay, here's a second beam. Why don't I get them to the same height? Neatness sake. And let me turn on a third beam. Now, parallel. 
three parallel beams. See, the interesting effect that occurs is that in this case, because the surface is curved in a circle shape, the beams come together. This, this is this beam, this is that beam, and the straight ahead beam. And they come together at a place which we call the focal point. And the distance between uh, the mirror and that place is called the focal length. Okay? And um, this is the way a concave surface protects the light. Um, and we call this a real image because you see that the light actually um, crosses here and comes out as though there were a source here. You see the light is coming out of that like a real source. So if, if I see this, it looks like a point of light emanation, a real point. So this gives me a real image because the light is actually passing through that point and coming out. So if I saw that, I would see light coming out of it. And it really did pass through that point. Now, on the other hand, if I turn it around and put the convex surface, this will vex me no end here. There we go. Hopefully. Now, you see the light is striking a surface which is peeling away from it, and the light reflects this way, outward. Now, we say that a surface like that creates a virtual image because, you see, if you project the lines back, it looks like they started out over here. And if you look at that from this distance, it would look like they're coming out of that place, but they never really got there. So this is what's called a virtual image because it looks like a light came from there, and it really never was there. Now, the, the focal point is um, important because uh, for example, you could do great things with this. For example, you could uh, collect sunlight and fo focus it intensely at a point. There are these farms um, where there are collections of mirrors, sort of solar collector farms, and they collect this light and focus it at a place you can burn through steel with light enough, enough of these focused mirrors. You could start a fire with it. Let's say you're lost in the woods and you have some shape. All you need is a shape like that, and you can collect enough sunlight. You can, um, uh, in principle, collect enough light to uh, start a little fire, so it's handy. Um, and what, what's nice about this is that it tells you that if, if, if you have parallel light coming in, Parallel beams all pass through the focal point. Do I have any more beams? No, I don't. I only have three. Oh, what's this? Oh, I have a fourth. Okay, maybe there's another one down here. No, that. Oh, yes, there is. Okay. I haven't played with this thing in a while. Ah, there we go. Oh, well, now that is not coaxial, unless I get it a little bit higher. But yeah, if I could, well, I, I collect as many as I can easily collect here. But parallel beams pass through the focal point. So that's, if, you, if you're working with problems with a, with a mirror, you know that parallel beams pass through the focal point, or beams that pass through the focal point will go parallel. It works both ways. So that's very handy information. It allows you to solve problems using mirrors. Um, so that's the, the main thing. Parallel beams pass through the focal point, and beams that pass through the focal point and go out parallel. Uh, the one that goes th th along the axis comes back along the axis because it's hitting the middle of the mirror and it's hitting it perpendicularly and it comes back perpendicularly. So that's another what we call principal ray. Uh, okay. So study that to realize that the focal points and focal lengths of both mirrors and lenses are key to solving problems. Now, the focal length of a mirror, it turns out, is half of the radius of the sphere from which it is cut. So this sphere goes around like that, I would guess, around like that because the focal point is over here. So the focal point is half, oh, half the radius. So I guess I should have drawn that more like that. Let's hope you didn't see that, okay. <laughs> I should have done it with black chalk. Uh, so the radius is about like here, and so I guess this, this spherical thingy is like that. So if here's the radius, oh, uh, the focal point is halfway there, okay? That looks between the light and the line surface. Okay, now, so that's for a spherical mirror. We, it'll turn out that lenses, which I will show you immediately, depend on Snell's law, which I'm now erasing. And the point being that in Snell, what's going to happen here is we're going to send in light, and the light is going to refract. It's going to bend toward the normal here. And as, as you pointed out, when it reaches this surface, it will bend away from the normal, like this. And so it will also come to a focus. It's going to bend toward the normal, and then in the case here, it's going to bend away from the normal. I didn't do that drawing very well. But the light will come to a focus. Let's see if I can grab a quick lens here. Uh, lens, lens. Well. This will do, I think. But let's try it anyhow. Now, here's a lens, which is thicker in the middle. Let's see if we can get some of those. See the lines better. In fact, OK. I'm trying to get those parallel beams. Can't get them all. But you see parallel beams pass through here. Uh, now, on the other hand, we have the opposite situation of a lens which is thinner in the middle, which is the analog of the um, mirror that is concave. Well, rather, well, this will be more like a convex mirror here. You see how here, when the, when the lens is thinner in the middle, the, the rays are diverging. And they seem to be coming from here, which gives us this virtual effect. Okay, I think probably our time is up and the physicist is going to descend on us in a moment. By the way, the talk we talk today is on physics education, so if you have any thoughts on that, you can say and listen and see how maybe physics education should be done. <laughs> okay, I think this will get you started on your lab work anyhow.